My name is Lee Freudenheim, and I'm the board chair for the Boston Preservation Alliance. Welcome to the 29th Annual Preservation Achievement Awards. On behalf of Allison, Paula, Hannah, and Greg, our amazing staff, the young advisors, the board of directors, and the awards selection committee, thank you very, very much. Would all of you please stand up, everyone I just mentioned? And thank you to the 104 sponsors and thousands of voters that participated in tonight's awards. Can you imagine that during the past three years, roughly 50,000 votes have been cast for the Fan Favorite Award? And can you imagine that this event sold out last week? I'd say the Alliance has come a long ways. And thank you to the Red Sox organization for your generosity and your support. I'd also like to recognize our president, Susan Park, for her tireless Alliance work over the past 39 years. She's sitting right there. She's the beautiful woman in the corner. Um, she is, without a doubt, the heart and soul of the Alliance. Um, and she's also my mentor in this crazy business. Today is an amazing time to live in Boston, but it's also a challenging time as good design tries to keep pace with a growing city. While embracing its inevitable changes, the city maintains a vibrant, culturally flooded environment filled with great history and a pretty good baseball team. We're very, very lucky to live here. Tonight we will celebrate 10 outstanding projects, but there are a lot more, and there is so much work left to be done. So I urge you to stay in touch with us, get involved. We're all part of the same family that loves this city. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the Executive Director of the Boston Preservation Alliance and my friend, Greg Gaylor. Thank you, Lee. Welcome to Fenway Park. Can anyone here imagine Boston without Fenway? I don't think so. Anyone? You wouldn't be brave enough to say. We're so blessed in this city with such a rich and varied treasure of historic places. Fenway Park is an icon, not just to us, but to the nation. It's a part of the rich, historic tapestry that defines Boston while well, it also contributes so very much to the vibrancy of our modern city. It's hard to believe that not long ago, losing Fenway Park was under consideration. A modern time needed a modern park. It would be easier straightening the leaning tower of Pisa. It just doesn't make economic sense. That's how the argument went. Yet today, this is a perfect place to celebrate the successes of historic preservation. Fenway demonstrates how historic buildings can evolve and change to meet modern needs, yet maintain the distinctive character that makes them such important parts of our city. It also demonstrates the power of strong, vocal, and active preservation community voices, like the Save Fenway Park group that we helped form. The group that stepped up to the plate when this revered temple of baseball was threatened. They show how a vocal, dedicated, and informed public can change the dialogue and ultimately the outcome. The ongoing success of Fenway is ultimately the result of partnerships and collaboration. Partnerships are what make communities work between the Red Sox and the city, the preservation community, neighborhood groups, designers, developers, and organizations like the Alliance. In fact, each project we recognize tonight demonstrates that it takes a village to make preservation work. We are pleased to lead Boston's preservation community and to honor a diversity of projects tonight that each support and demonstrate the importance of our mission to protect places, promote vibrancy, and to preserve the character of Boston. 
Thanks to each and every one of you for supporting the Alliance, for attending tonight, and being a part of our team. And if you want to be an extra special team player tonight, break out those cell phones, we won't be offended. Help spread the word via social media. Let those unable to be here with us know what they're missing. I want to join Lee in thanking those that make the Alliance's work possible, in addition to our board and our young advisors, I want to thank Mayor Walsh, our honorary chairman, for his support of the work that we do. I want to thank our organizational and individual members who make us a strong, true alliance working throughout the city. And it's amazing to think that we now, as Lee mentioned, have 104 corporate members. Many of you here tonight, and those names will be scrolling all night long. A broad array of corporate members really shows that preservation isn't an esoteric calling supported by people stuck in the past. It demonstrates how essential the unique historic character of Boston is to its success and its future. In particular, I want to acknowledge our Alliance leaders and underwriters, the Boston Red Sox, the Drucker Company, and Elkis Manfredi Architects. And on the latter, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the loss earlier this year of our dear friend Howard Elkis. Howard and David Manfredi received our inaugural President's Award in 2014 and have long been friends, supporters, and vocal advocates for the Alliance in our work. David Manfredi and your team, thank you for being here and for allowing us to have the honor of continuing to hold Howard close to our hearts as we continue the work he so earnestly believed in. Now before we get on to our winners, a few quick logistical items. So tonight, we're not going to have award winners come up to the stage, but instead, so we're sure to recognize everyone from each team. After your project is described, if you're affiliated with the project in any way, please stand up and be recognized. And we'll be taking photographs of project teams immediately after the ceremony and handing out the physical awards then uh, in the rear, overlooking the field in that direction. Presenting the awards tonight is Roger Tackiff, Alliance Vice Chair and Award Selection, Selection Committee Chairman. Roger, thank you so much for all you do for the Alliance and have done for so many years. Roger Tackiff. I'll move that over a little bit. Can everybody hear me up in the back? Anybody who doesn't want to hear me, let me know. Huh. Good evening, and thank you, Greg, for your warm introduction. As chairman of the awards committee, it is my privilege to welcome all of you to the 2017 Alliance Achievement Awards. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful fall evening. We got lucky, and that's what my notes told me to say. And most, what's most exciting is to recognize tonight's recipients. What, <laughs> what's more exciting is to recognize tonight's recipients at Fenway Park, in the shadow of the legendary Green Monster. And by the way, wow, the Sox are in first. I would be, that deserves an applause, absolutely. I would be remiss if I didn't say how appreciative we are to the Boston Red Sox, their management, and their ownership for helping sponsor this evening's awards. Having been a part of the Boston Preservation Alliance for more than a few years, Many must remember all too well when Fenway Park was tired, worn out, and ever so close to demolition. Today's Fenway Park is not the Fenway of old, not the stadium many of us grew up with. As a youngster, I didn't know which was more challenging, the intimidating food, the bathrooms, or loving a losing team. We at the Alliance, then led by our fearless leader, Susan Park, will always take a great deal of pride in having helped save Fenway from demolition and working so closely with the Red Sox to preserve this landmark. Few buildings exemplify more why we are here this evening than Fenway Park, Boston's most recognized landmark and America's ballpark. Most of you have probably had a long day and could just as well have been home relaxing with your family and friends but you chose to join us here tonight to make a difference. As the Red Sox have been the guardians of arguably our most recognized historic structure, 
all of you are the guardians of Boston's built environment, the fabric that makes Boston special. When our historic fabric is at risk, when our beautiful public spaces are threatened, or when the pace of new development with scores of planned new towers threatens to overwhelm our city, it is up to each and every one of you here tonight to raise your voices and make a difference. We are so fortunate to have been given a precious legacy, and it is up to us to make certain that it is protected, preserved, and enriched for the next generation. This evening, we are here to celebrate and offer our appreciation to those award recipients who have fought the good fight and have done so so effectively. Individually and as teams, you have worked so hard, and we trust that you will work, your work will serve as an example for all who choose to make a difference in the future. We tip our hats to you and congratulate you on your accomplishments. So without further delay, let us begin with the first award. Takes me a little while to get started, I apologize. <laughs> Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight story of Paul Revere. What school child has not stood nervously reciting Longfellow's storied poem? On that night of April 18th, 1775, silversmith Paul Revere left his small wooden home in Boston's North End and set out on a journey that would ultimately make him a legend. Today, that home is still standing at 19 North Street in Boston's North End. Now a National Historic Landmark, the Paul Revere House is one of the oldest buildings in all of Boston. The Revere home was constructed in 1680, 337 years ago, on the site of the former parsonage of the Second Church of Boston until it was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1676. A new home was built at the same location about four years later and eventually purchased by Paul Revere in 1770. The former tradesman's dwelling proved an ideal for Revere's growing family, and the Revere family owned the home for most of the next three decades. Subsequent to the Revere family's ownership, the home served as a sailor's boarding house, and the downstairs was variously, variously converted into a candy store, an Italian bank, a cigar factory, and a vegetable and fruit business. In 1902, Paul Revere's great-grandson purchased the building and turned it into a museum, saving it from its demolition. For more than 100 years, this important but modest house has been increasingly challenged to accommodate the vast numbers of visitors who simply wanted a glimpse into the home of a true American patriot. In a bold effort to preserve this precious landmark and embark on a roadmap for the future, the Paul Revere Memorial Association in collaboration with architect Craig Whitaker, purchased the two adjacent row houses built in the 1830s on land actually once owned by Paul Revere. These two structures stand as rare survivors of the row house architectural style and now provide new and important space for the Paul Revere homestead to accommodate its growth. This project was not simply about expansion but about a critical need for more educational and programming space, and at long last, being able to accommodate visitors with disabilities. During the renovations, the team meticulously uncovered, retained, and restored significant components of these early 19th century row houses. The team also sought to represent the choices which different homeowners of the colonial era might have made to improve their half of the two-family residence. On the interior during demolition, twin 1835 cooking fireplaces with their battered wooden surrounds and granite hearths were uncovered and restored as the inspiration for this thoughtful restoration. Balusters, paneling, newel posts, and even railings, which had long since been removed during previous restorations, were actually found in the home's basement, patiently awaiting their rediscovery. And after a great deal of TLC, they were reinstalled. The home this exterior celebrates the 19th century of two over two window sashes and the exterior masonry walls still offer evidence of the building's evolution from a two-story to a three-story structure with decorative roofline trim and two generations of clapboards still visible. Equally importantly, the project included an extensive redesign of the courtyard between the Paul Revere House and the new educational and visitor center between the two homes. 
the courtyard now serves as a wonderful open gathering space while also creating accessible entrances to the Revere House and even revealing parts of a long covered over cobble path discovered by urban archaeologists during construction. The purchase and restoration of these two row houses at 5 and 6 Lathrop Place, adjacent to the Paul Revere Homestead, with their typical, typical progression from private homes to tenement houses with first floor shops to neglect, was a courageous undertaking by the Paul Revere Memorial Association. Future generations, and most especially future generations of our children, will be able to partake in the timeless and wonderful story so integral to our nation's independence because of their commitment. We would like to congratulate all those who took part in this restoration. Will the team from the Paul Revere House please stand and be acknowledged? Thank you. There they are. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you from all of us. Our next award is for 101 Beacon Street, situated prominently on the south side of Beacon Street and the public garden. By the early 1850s, Boston's public garden had been well established with a retaining wall on the west side facing what would later become the Back Bay neighborhood. And on the north side, the public garden was bordered by the old mill dam, which ran all the way to Brookline. On August 1st, 1857, the land was purchased from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to build one of the first new townhouses in Boston's Back Bay. And this home remained an elegant single family residence for nearly 100 years. 101 Beacon Street was constructed in 1862 as a five-story mansarded townhouse and formed an appropriate bookend to a series of six contiguous houses built at the same time and in the same style. By the 1950s, this prominent home, visible to everyone entering the Back Bay from Star or Drive, had suffered greatly from diminished circumstances and neglect. Sadly, in 1959, the once grand townhouse was purchased by a new owner who did a careless conversion of 101 into an apartment house. The once an elegant exterior staircase was removed, the signature brownstone facade was painted white, and the mansard was disfigured with an incongruous and downright ugly new floor added on top of the building. It almost seemed as if a small suburban ranch house had been dropped atop this historic structure. For more than 60 years, this, compo this compromised residence stood in stark contrast to its more elegant neighbors. Fortunately, in 2014, 101 Beacon Street was purchased by an experienced developer and preservationist, Andy Constantine. In concert with the creative design talents of the architects Michael Scanlon and Chu and Company, 101 Beacon Street has at long last been restored to its distinguished stature of prominence. Working closely with the Boston Landmarks Commission, the development team recreated the traditional mansard roof and redesigned and diminished the impact of the rooftop addition using balcony cresting to stand prominently and read from Beacon Street below. Additionally, they incorporated fenestration that drew comfortably from examples of surrounding buildings. The insensitive L on the rear of the building was removed, as were the two floors of aluminum siding. During construction, the original portico, stonework, front door, and transom jams were uncovered. And an important decision was made to surrender the square footage from the interiors in order to reopen the portico with French doors and a balcony proudly opening to full view so that the home's entry would be strongly reestablished. A narrative can be helpful, but the before and after photographs in front of you tonight speak volumes about the dedicated and creative energies that brought this prominent building back to its original elegant stature. <clears throat> With the 
team from 101 Beacon Street, please stand up and be recognized. Thank you. Congratulations. Our next award recipient, 451, only a few blocks down from 101 Beacon Street, is a development which took advantage of a really unusual opportunity in Boston's historic Back Bay. In 1887, on what was originally four lots, from 451 to 457 Marlborough Street, four townhouses were built. Unfortunately, in 1967, they were demolished. One of the most difficult urban planning challenges that an architect and a developer face is how to deal with a significant developable parcel in a landmark neighborhood. The challenge on this site was how to replace an out-of-place 1960s single-story structure on such an intact historic street. As preservationists, our first inclination is to draw on the context and seek to be respectful of the historic fabric that surrounds this parcel. For this development, the architects, the developers, and the Landmarks Commission itself sought to find a new vernacular which was both respectful of the surrounding architecture and also made a distinctively new statement. One of the most experienced and respected practitioners of this difficult and challenging work, especially in Boston, is the architect David Hassin. Working in collaboration with the developer, the Holland Companies, David has done a superb job of achieving a sensitive balance between the new and the old. 451 Marlborough Street's massing artfully navigates the significant height differences between the historic neighbors, the seven-story eclectic and exuberant Charles Gate on one side and the more traditional Marlborough Street townhouses on the other. The new design draws on elements from each in creating a modern form. The gracious main entrance of 451 is framed in cast stone and granite, and the street facade is punctuated by individual townhouse entries and window bays that continue the intimately scaled residential rhythm of the street, reinforcing the character and texture of the neighborhood to the new architect. The new architecture includes brick, precast limestone, metal cladding, and iron fencing to reflect the iconic Marlborough Street streetscape, but with a decidedly contemporary methodology. Even the, more, the important pedestrian experience is thoughtfully crafted to seamlessly flow from historic architecture to new architecture and back to historic architecture. 451 Marlborough Street resoundingly celebrates the use of a careful attention to detail, fine quality materials, and a thoughtful design, together creating a new architectural form while still feeling comfortable in the richness of the late 19th century architecture. We would like to congratulate all of, who, all of you who took part in this architecture. Will the team from 451 Marlboro Street please stand up and be recognized? Um, there they are. Okay. Thank you. God, they're all so young. <laughs> or I'm not. <laughs> Our next award recipient is the terminal storage building located in Charlestown. One of the really fun aspects of being a part of the BPA's award committee is unexpectedly finding a project worthy of recognition which is not one in one of Boston's more fashionable neighborhoods, but in a part of the city where even lifelong Bostonians may never have been. The terminal storage building is located in an industrial section of Charlestown on Medford Street along the Mystic River. The distinctive century-old woolen warehouse is a part of a collection of three large-scale industrial buildings which were built in 1912. Together, they are rare surviving elements of this commercial di di district and of the Charlestown waterfront. They were constructed to serve as storage facilities for the transshipment of goods between railroad and ship throughout the port. The terminal storage building is illustrative 
of an era when railroads and ships served as the primary modes of transportation for goods in and out of Boston. By the mid-1980s, the buildings had been completely abandoned and remained so for nearly 30 years. The roof had failed, there was a significant amount of water damage, and flooring inside was literally collapsing. Tonight, the Alliance recognizes, recognizes the unrelenting perseverance for two decades of the terminal storage building's developer, Michael Rossio. Michael undertook this nearly two decade long fight to prevent the building's demolition and overcome seemingly endless legal challenges to ultimately repurpose and renovate this warehouse into 121 loft apartments and two commercial spaces. These new, edgy, urban residential spaces are wonderful because they are truly lofts in the traditional sense with unrepaired brick walls, massive beams, oversized windows, and all of the mechanical systems exposed and woven across the ceiling there to support bicycles and everything else you can imagine. As a developer, Michael had the foresight to see value in this tired old building where others did not. And its residents, the neighborhood, and Boston benefited from his vision. Using historic tax credits, the terminal storage building adds vibrancy to this part of Charlestown and as an added bonus, Michael's efforts even resulted in the designation of the Terminal Storage Warehouse District to the National Register of Historic Places. An area once dominated by major industrial activity is now home to a new generation of urban pioneers looking for opportunities in a changing neighborhood. We would like to congratulate all of those who took part in this restoration. Will the team from the Terminal Storage Building please stand up to be acknowledged? I'm looking around, Michael. There you are. Congratulations. <laughs> Great job. Our next award recipient is Shamit Design and Construction for the renovations of their inspiring and innovative new work environment. Today, this distinguished firm specializes in complex and logistically challenging projects with decades of the highest quality preservation of Boston's built environment. Shamit, a Boston's built environment, nearly qualifying Shamit for landmark status itself. From its finding in 1982, Shamit has become a construction manager with more than 1,100 employees who will undertake more than $1 billion of business this year. They are an organization owned by their employees in an ESOP, and nearly 80% of their business comes from continuing relationships. They also have long-term partnerships with more than 26 philanthropic organizations. Shaman has become so much a part of Boston's fabric that much of their high quality and uncompromising work is immediately recognizable, including the bowling project in Dudley, Trinity Church, Harvard Medical School, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, MIT's iconic Great Dome, the Old North Church, the Old State House, and the list could go on and on. And just for the fun of it, their retail division, both in Boston and Fifth Avenue, includes such modest clients as Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Dior, Gucci, and of course, Apple. With such a distinguished resume, how does one create an environment for this forward-thinking organization? Well, if you're Shamit, you begin with an historic building in Boston's exciting SOA Warehouse District. 560 Harrison Avenue is a large masonry and heavy timber-framed factory-style building originally built in 1890 as the home of the Emerson Piano Company. Shamit selected for their architectural partner in this exciting adventure, CBT, who Shamit had collaborated with on countless other projects transforming their previously fragmented and outdated office layout into a new, dramatic, light-filled, open office environment required Shamit to experience the design-build process from the client's perspective. Together, Shamit and CBT reconfigured the outdated work environment from mostly private offices to more than 90% open, fluid workstations. The goal was to have collaboration and communication between team members and to have it occur organically. The project team created a flexible array of workstations to accommodate the various needs 
of the multi-generational employee group, I think I'm multi-generational, they even developed a simple furniture kit which could easily be reconfigured to accommodate the individual needs of each employee while incorporating sit-to-stand desks and minimal obstructions to the rest of the office. There was also a diverse array of collaboration spaces, including more than 18 multi-use spaces, providing for maximum flexibility in today's ever-changing work environment. Shamit's new and casual open work environment with huddled spaces, comfy red chairs, and flat screen TVs fosters teamwork and is perfect for small group focus sessions. There are very few closed doors in this upbeat and transparent work environment, which undertakes more than 500 projects annually. The, the vibe at Shamit Design and Construction newly renovated offices is more like a well-funded startup than a 35-year-old construction firm, where indie rock music comes in the lobby cafe with its polished concrete floors, exposed brick, and a steel beam sculpture is affixed to the 20-foot ceiling. Shamit's body of work, their social conscience, and their work environment all come together in this 19th century piano warehouse with a 21st century environment. I find Shamit design and construction such an inspiring story that if I were 23 years old, as opposed to 63 years old, I would apply for a job. Would the Shaman organization please stand up and be recognized? Wow. They're in the back. Thank you, and terrific job. Okay. Our next award recipient, I apologize. For our next award recipient, we are recognizing the McMullen Museum of Art and Conference Center at Boston College. Along Commonwealth Avenue in Brighton stands a rather grand and elegant Renaissance Revival manor house, which many of you may never have noticed, and still others never knew it even existed. This imposing structure was never meant to be part of the public realm. It was, in fact, owned by the Archdiocese of Boston and was the stately home for generations of Boston's storied cardinals, from Cardinal William O'Connell to Richard Cardinal Cushing, and finally to Bernard Cardinal Law. It even hosted Pope John Paul II. It was, in fact, a statement home, a symbol of the power and reach of the Catholic Church in Boston. The first floor of the residence was where guests were entertained in an elaborate fashion. The upper floor served as the cardinal's private residence. The building was designed in 1927 by McGinnis and Walsh as the centerpiece of archdiocesan power and wealth, and was often referred to as Little Rome. When Cardinal Sean O'Malley arrived in Boston more than a decade ago, he quite extraordinarily chose to make his residence in a modest apartment at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in the South End. Soon thereafter, the archdiocese, archdiocese conveyed the manor house and the Brighton property to Boston College. BC courageously made the decision not to tear down the vestige from another era, with all of its symbolism. Instead, they undertook a commitment to sensitively transition this imposing 23,000 square foot residential structure into the inspiring McMullen Museum of Art and Conference Center as the foundation of a new arts district. In addition to the original home, the college added a 7,000 square foot striking contemporary glass wing. The former residence and its new addition has now been preserved, renovated, and repurposed by the architectural team of DeMilla and Schaefer, and is now becoming accessible to a broad and diverse community. The first phase of this restoration project was to restore the grandeur of the facade, including its original limestone, marble and mahogany finishes, even accessing quarries in Indiana to replicate the original limestone detailing so as to achieve a seamless match. Restoration, however, was not the only goal of this project. The goal was to reuse the reuse of the space to best serve the Boston College community, the needs of the museum, and the community at large. By adding a three-story glass wing to the historic structure, the team injected fluidity 
natural light, and accessibility to the space. The transparent addition also provides a wonderfully engaging entrance for the museum's new home, which now occupies the second and fl third floors of the residence. This jewel box-like addition was designed to accomplish a clarity between the new and the old. And I quote, the new addition is designed such that the details are respectful of the existing structure, both in proportion and materials, with detailing that is contemporary in nature rather than a confusing replication. The brightness and accessibility of the addition transform an introverted private mansion into an extroverted art and university conference center. The completed building inspires innovation, collaboration, scholarly pursuits, and an enthusiasm for art. We would like to congratulate all of those who took part in this museum. Will the team from the McMullen House McMullen Museum of Art and Conference Center please stand up and be recognized? Where are you all? Over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, from institution to institution. Our next award is given to a truly prodigious project, the restoration of the imposing Gordon Hall at Harvard Medical School. In the early part of the 1900s, when Harvard Medical School established its new clinical departments and rewrote the curriculum for innovative medical education, it was clear that a new campus had to be built to both accommodate and celebrate the dramatic changes in medical care and training. In 1906, five buildings were constructed on what was previously only swamp and farmland. Together they formed the medical quadrangle of Harvard Medical School on Longwood Avenue with Gordon Hall serving as the focal point. Today, with the medical school at its centerpiece, we know this location as the Longwood Medical Area, also known as the bustling LMA. Previously and ironically, Harvard Medical School occupied the Boston Public Library's adjacent site where the Philip Johnson Building stands today. Gordon Hall was designed by Shepley, Shepley, Rutten, and Coolidge, now Shepley Bullfinch, in a neoclassical style. As legend would have it, in a typical Yankee gesture of frugality, the marble used to construct Gordon Hall was purchased at a discount by the builders after it had been deemed unsuitable for the New York City Public Library project. <laughs> in the years that followed, the Harvard Medical School quadrangle served as a catalyst to develop even more of the adjacent Martian farmlands of the Longwood area, transforming them into the Beth Israel, the Deaconess, the Robert Beck Brigham, and Children's Hospitals. Commencing in 2016, Harvard Medical School's institutional commitment to excellence and innovation impelled it to undertake the restoration of Gordon Hall, incorporating 19th century craftsmanship and 21st century technologies. For this project, the medical school engaged the design team of McKinley, Caslow, and Associates to evaluate the condition of the impressive marble exterior and unfortunately its deteriorated historic elements. After a comprehensive inspection, McGimley brought together an accomplished team which included Shamit Design and Construction, Haven Restoration, and a broad and distinguished range of specialists to embark on this complex and challenging restoration project to stabilize and restore century-old materials. When elements of this exquisitely detailed facade were beyond repair, the team then carefully utilized the original materials as models for replacement. The building was, later scan was laser scanned, new 3D models were printed, and an elaborate array, array of technologies, technologies were employed to cut marble, prevent further rust and decay, and secure the lar largest marble Dutchman ever installed in New England. Shamit employed among the most skilled local masons to hand carve and when needed to carve in place missing or unsalvageable elements and even veined and tinted marble replacement to have the new flawlessly blend with the old. The result is a seamless transition between the restoration of the often fragile exterior 
and the replicated new elements. The bringing together of the skilled and gifted team and their commitment to and mastery of both traditional craftsmanship and cutting edge technology serves as a noteworthy tribute to the preeminent traditions of Harvard Medical School and their dedication to the finest and most innovative medical care. Will the team from Harvard Medical School, Scordon Hall, please stand up and be acknowledged. <laughs> As expected, that was a big team. All right. Our city, Boston, is often referred to as the Athens of America. We are blessed to have some of the most respected institutions in the country, from renowned colleges and universities to hospitals to an enviable park system, and most importantly, an historic legacy dating back to the colonial era. Distinguished among these institutions is the world-class Boston Public Library, one of the first publicly supported, free, municipal libraries in the nation, established in 1848. The Boston Public Library for generations has been symbolized by its much-loved landmark building designed in 1895 by McKim, Mead, and White. In the early 1970s, the renowned architect Philip Johnson was commissioned to design an important addition to the original structure. When the Johnson Wing was first built on Boylston Street, Boston was a decidedly different city, a city in retreat. Mr. Johnson was given a mandate to design his new addition while respecting the existing roof line of the McKim building and to utilize granite from the original Milford Quarry that gave the landmark Copley Square building its stately presence. The intention was that the building's historic facade and the new addition would work in harmony. As most of us know by now, the two buildings never really worked comfortably together. The library's trustees were challenged to reinvent a library for the 21st century within the existing Philip Johnson envelope. One of the most critical yet challenging project milestones was to open up the McKim building to the new public plaza in what the Boston Globe termed structural gymnastics. The McKim building's fragile, century-old, load-bearing masonry wall was punctuated with a 35-foot opening to enhance the connection between the Johnson and McKim buildings. The new structural framing ensuring needed to be designed to support a load of more than one million pounds of the McKim Building's unreinforced masonry wall. In addition, two massive 10 foot by 8 foot reinforced concrete columns, each carrying a load of more than 300,000 pounds, had to be removed from the Johnson Building in order to create the connection between the two buildings. The Johnson edition of the 1970s, in many respects, was designed to be a fortification from the vagaries of a divided city. By opening up the connection between the two buildings, taking down the surrounding barriers, and bringing the sidewalks flush with the dramatic two-story windows, the architects made the very institution itself seem more approachable. Through the glass facade, pedestrians are invited into bright, a brightly lit space, offering a cafe, a bookstore-like selection of new and novel fiction on tables, a state-of-the-art, completely open television studio for WGBH, with a rectangular glass curtain, a retractable glass curtain, and an interactive screen where patrons can access the library's extensive digital archives. The skilled architectural engineering team, led by Ronan and Colley, in conjunction with the construction manager, Consigli, worked creatively to recapture much of Philip Johnson's original vision, where the visitor would experience the shock of a big space when entering the building. The renovation has preserved the integrity of the addition while revitalizing it with access to views and daylight, innovative programming, and a vibrant color palette. The strengthened connection between the historic McKim Building and the Johnson Building now unifies the library from a book repository to an open and inviting space where all are welcome. Carved in the facade of the Boston Public Library's McKim Building are the library's principles, including the commitment to be free to all 
and serving to educate people as the safeguard of order and liberty. It's been so exciting to see the proof that when you renovate, innovate, and offer spaces and services that meet people where they are and what they need, they embrace it. This is the beginning of the renaissance of the public library at the heart of the community in Boston. Congratulations to the team from the public library. Please stand up and be recognized. Sir, and in back also. Thank you. I was never really able to be quiet as a child in the library, but that's neither here nor there. We knew that. <laughs> this evening, you might wonder why we have chosen for a second time the Boston Public Library. However, these two awards could not be more different. In the previous award, you heard about the reimagining of the Johnson Building to welcome our city's next generation. What we should never overlook is that the McKim Building's architecture and its collection of rare artwork are world-renowned. The firm of McKim, Mead, and White also designed such iconic structures as Madison Square Garden, Columbia University, the New York Public Library with the Good Marble, Boston Symphony Hall, and even portions of the White House. When Charles Follum McKim designed our library, his palace for the people, he also commissioned the French painter Pierre Pouvy de Charnay, one of the greatest muralists in all of Europe, to create his only mural masterpiece outside of France. Approaching his 70s, when the work was commissioned, the artist was reluctant to make the trip to Boston. Therefore, quite incredibly, a model of the space, dimensions, and samples of the yellow Sienna marble from the library staircase was sent to him so that he could match his palette and design to the libraries. The result was a series of eight absolutely splendid allegorical panels which surround the library's grand staircase. The philosophy panel is one of those, with the other subjects including astronomy, chemistry, physics, pastoral poetry, dramatic poetry, epic poetry, and a broader panel, the muses of inspiration welcome the spirit of enlightenment. In the words of the artist, having been entrusted the honor of decorating the staircase of the Boston Library, I have sought to represent under a simple, single form and in a single view the intellectual treasures collected in this beautiful building." End quote. In late 2014, a Boston Public Library exhibitions and outreach associate, Megan, Megan Weeks, observed a strange patch of light hitting the very top right-hand side of one of these canvases. The light turned out to be a speck of dust, and the dust had collected on a bulge of sorts. A bulge in artwork is never something an art steward wants to see. The Siobhan mural is the pastoral-hued philosophy panel with two robed Athenian figures in debate, backed by the Acropolis. When Weeks noticed the damage to the 120-year-old painting, for her and the library, it was considered a crisis. She alerted her colleagues, who together immediately called the city's top art expert, Gianfranco Pocobeni, who was head of conservation at Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Together, they immediately mobilized to bring in temporary scaffolding to inspect the entire surface, where they determined that 75 to 80 percent of the mural had actually been detached from its plaster base. Moisture from the elevator shaft behind the mural had degraded metal supports and plaster that had been holding the mural in place. Even Pocobeni had never before seen something like this, so he reached out to his mentor Ian Hutkinson, Professor Emeritus at Queen's University, who had been restoring important murals for half a century. With some minimally invasive tests at the very bottom of the mural, they determined that with only slight physical movement, the mural would shatter. The philosophy panel seems as if it was painted right on the wall, but as we know, it was actually created in Paris using oils on linen canvas. The canvases were shipped to Boston in 1895 and placed on the walls above the grand staircase using a binding technique called miraflage. Weeks likens the application of the mural series to installing artful wallpaper, very, very expensive wallpaper, and it's really not ever meant to come off. Unfortunately, to fix the damaged mural, it needed to come off completely. 
the conservators devised a procedure for securing a bracing support to the mural intact while they subjected it to the trauma of removal. They even built a reduced size model to test their methodologies before applying their theories to the real thing. Once taken down, the fragile 120-year-old mural was carefully maneuvered through the library's echoing corridors on its way up to the third floor restoration studio. It should be well noted that there was absolutely nothing in the literature for a project such as this, and the BPL is actually hoping to publish the results of this extraordinarily successful high stakes mural restoration. Today, with an invisible protective lining, the irreplaceable mural has been seamlessly reinstalled in its place of distinction with no indication that it was ever damaged or removed. We would like to congratulate all of those who took part in this restoration, and will the team from the Boston Public Library's Philosophy Mural Restoration Project please stand up? There they are. After I'm done, you can tell me how I mispronounced the names, and I apologize in advance. All right. And. Finally, this is the first time in the Alliance's 39-year history that we have ever recognized a book, and we are so very proud to do so. Heroic, Concrete Architecture and the New Boston is an evocative title of a critically acclaimed book about brutalist architecture, authored by Mark Pasnick, Michael Kudo, and Chris Grimley. It is the aspiration of the authors that their groundbreaking work of scholarship will help most of us better appreciate an important and even essential part of Boston's architectural heritage, which is much maligned and, more importantly, much misunderstood. I must confess that I, too, plead guilty to being chronically undereducated and misinformed regarding this architectural style. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the word heroic as having the characteristics of a hero larger than life, behavior that is bold, dramatic, and unexpectedly or even excessively so. In the ancient world, concrete was not a material deemed suitable for the facade of monumental architecture. However, its pliable nature was valued and used to form curvilinear buildings, such as the Pantheon in Rome. Today, when combined with rebar, poured in place, or even precast, concrete in architecture has come to symbolize vestiges of an unforgiving and austere design. For the authors, even the name brutalism is a misnomer, as an adaptation of beton brut, or raw concrete. In fact, the authors present the theme that brutalist structures were actually idealistic strivings for a new utopian civic architecture, where the hard-edged concrete was intended to echo the classical brick and stone buildings for the city where it is known. Let me pose this question to you all. Is Boston's new city hall, designed in 1968 by Coleman McKinnell, an ugly albatross around Boston's civic government, or an iconic architectural statement to be celebrated and perhaps even venerated? While some have called the building one of Boston's ugliest edifices, in 1976 at our bicentennial, a poll of architects, historians, and architectural critics listed Boston City Hall, along with Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia campus and Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water as one of the 10 proudest achievements of American architecture. Make no mistake about it, the debate, the impassioned debate, continues. The book Heroic educates us and informs us of how these monumental concrete buildings were a statement, a statement of our city's renaissance from the Great Depression the unhappy experience of urban renewal, and the bitter battles over school desegregation. After decades of stagnation, decline, and the legendary corruption of its elected officials,
Boston's leadership used public investment as a catalyst for enormous economic growth, and that investment would result in a generation of new and bold buildings with the shared vocabulary, concrete modernism. In 1976, Boston was widely viewed as an urban laboratory for the exploration of concrete structural and sculptural qualities. What emerged was a vision for our city, its widespread revitalization, often referred to as the new Boston. These bold concrete architectural forms that transformed sleepy Boston through the 1960s and 1970s were conceived of by a highly educated, progressive-minded group of civic leaders who were risk takers and who brought to Boston some of the most influential architects of their day, including I.M. Pei, Henry Cobb, Gerhard Kalman, Michael McKennell, Paul Rudolph, Joseph Louis Sert, along with the architect's collaboratives, Walter Gropius. Their works are seen pro prominently throughout Greater Boston, from City Hall to Government Center to the New England Aquarium to important academic centers at Harvard, Boston University, MIT, and Brandeis. The worldwide phenomenon of building entire buildings out of concrete re represented one of the major architectural movements of the post-war years. And these authors help us understand that in Boston, it was employed with more numerous and diverse civic, cultural, and academic projects than in any other city in the country. Whether you hate these buildings, love them, or with the help of the authors are learning to appreciate them, the idealism and movement that inspired monumental concrete architecture is important to understand. These iconic structures have become the very foundations upon which the new Boston, like a phoenix out of the ashes, has once again taken its place as a world-class city. Would the authors Mark, Michael, and Chris please stand up and be recognized? Where are you? There they are. Thank you. Great job, guys. Greg. I thank you for your attention and appreciate the time and turn the program over to Allison. Good evening, my name is Allison Frazee and I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Alliance. For the fifth year, it was my pleasure to organize site visits this past May to tour some of the nominated projects with our awards selection committee. I look forward to that day every year because we get to see the amazing work that all of you were doing. This year, one of the sites we visited was a first church in Roxbury. And we learned about the preservation efforts to restore the exterior of the 1804 building. This is the oldest surviving wood frame church in Boston, and the current meeting house is the fifth on this site since the first congregation was founded in 1631. You can feel the history when you're there, and we are so thankful that the current stewards of the site, the United Universalist Urban Ministry, are dedicated to its preservation. But as we know, preservation takes time, patience, a skilled team, and funding. Large-scale projects like this often require several phases over many years with multiple rounds of fundraising. The next phase of this project will continue over the next few years, and we look forward to following along and supporting their work. So tonight, we celebrate the progress that's been made to carefully restore the First Church in Roxbury with our stewardship recognition. We applaud the Urban Ministry's dedication and encourage everyone to not only go see this amazing gem, but also support the fundraising efforts for its preservation. And if you do go, be sure you ask them to ring the church bell the, up in the steeple. It's a lot of fun, I promise. <laughs> if uh, we would please um, recognize the Stewardship Award, the First Church in Roxbury, if you would please stand. Now, it's my pleasure to announce the winner of this year's Fan Favorite Award, 
This award is always a lot of fun for me because I get notified every time a vote comes in, um, which over the last four years means about 50,000 notifications. But each one reminds me that Bostonians care about preservation and they care about the work that you're doing. Everyone in the room tonight is a winner, but one project did emerge as a clear fan favorite with over 2,000 votes. I have a special guest here to help me present the award tonight. We figured since we're at Fenway Park, we'd invite the biggest fan that we know to come and help present the fan favorite award. <laughs> Thank you, Wally. And so the award goes to the McMullen Museum of Art and Conference Center. If you would please stand again. McMullen, please stand. Where are you? There they are, back there. Thank you, Wally. And thank you all for voting. Now, how do you, they say don't follow a dog, but Wally's even tougher, I tell you. We'll see you in a bit, Wally. Take a seat if you'd like. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for all the project teams, and thank you for bearing with my bad sense of humor. I'm, I'm the one responsible for the fan as the fan favorite, so if you don't like it, criticize me. So on to our Codman Lifetime Achievement Award. Richard Bertman is someone that probably needs no introduction to most people in the room tonight. As one of Boston's most active architects, the B of C, B, T, his hands and design talent are imprinted all around Boston and well beyond. As a former and longtime member of the Alliance Board, a recipient himself of our Codman Lifetime Achievement Award in 2012, a longtime friend and colleague of Robert Campbell, and one who has likely had his share of appreciation, and I'm guessing collegial frustration with some of Robert's writing, he seems an appropriate person to present this year's Codman Award. Richard? It certainly does uh, give me great pleasure to present this award to uh, the, the Codman Award for Lifetime Achievement to Robert Campbell, a friend whom, if memory serves me, I've known for over 40 years when we both served together at the BAC on the board of directors. And it is interesting to me to recall how captivated I was back then by Robert's thoughtful, perceptive, and articulate comments during those long meetings. It's impressed me in, in reading Bob's writings over these ensuing years that there is still that same positive quality in his writings that back then stimulated our thinking and discussions, and there are still the thoughtful suggestions on how things might be done better. <laughs> you had here then. <laughs> to me, this positive, constructive attitude continues to be, to be the hallmark of Bob's commentaries. And of course, Robert has received a myriad of awards um, over the last years, and I'd just like to mention some of them. This is pretty impressive, so don't be embarrassed. Robert is both a writer and an architect, as well as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He graduated from Harvard, Phi Beta Kappa, and then went on to receive a master's in journalism from Columbia, as well as a master, master's in architecture from Harvard. <clears throat> He helped found the National Mayor's Institute for City Design, which brings together mayors, designers, and other experts to help solve city problems throughout our country, and he continues to be an advisor to that organization. He's received a design fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. 
and for his work on the television series Beyond the Big Dig, received the Columbia DuPont Award. He has been architect in residence at the American Academy in Rome, and for his knowledgeable writings in architecture, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in criticism. Closer to home, he is the recipient of the Award of Honor from the Boston Society of Architects. That's the society's highest honor. And of course, we all recall looking forward on Sundays to those wonderful Globe magazine articles that he wrote accompanied by Peter Vander Walker's iconic photographs that documented how our city has changed over time. To me, Cityscapes of Boston, the book that came out of that partnership, is certainly a Boston landmark. So please welcome the recipient of the, ninth, of the 2017 Codman Award for Lifetime Achievement, Robert Campbell. What do you do after a Lifetime Achievement Award? <laughs> um, I was told I should ta talk for more than three or four minutes. I usually, when I'm writing, don't get to my verb in three or four minutes. Um, and I can't tell anybody here anything about preservation because you all know so much more about it than I do. Uh, I'm honored by this award. It's the Codman Award, uh, uh, which immediately takes us back into history. Uh, the Codman family, Ogden Codman, who wrote a book with uh, uh, Edith Wharton on the decoration of houses. Um, and I, I'm, what I'm going to do is just, uh, as I sat down today, I thought of half a dozen contacts I'd had with the world of preservation and thought about them, and that's all I'm going to do. I do want to mention, as, as uh, uh, was just mentioned, Peter Vanderwalker, the photographer, who is a director of this institution, uh, is someone without whom I would have accomplished nothing. Uh, Peter is the sort of person who gets on the phone at 5 o'clock in the morning and says, why haven't you written the text that we're collaborating on? Um, and I have desperately needed people like that all my life, and I wish he could be here. Uh, we talked about Fenway Park. Um, I'm fascinated. I'm really, really pleased to be honored at the same time that Fenway Park is being honored. Um, I remember when it was going to be torn down. I remember when uh, the new owners uh, took it over and Janet Marie Smith, uh, who had done a similar job in Baltimore, uh, came to Boston. And I had known her when she was a student at Mississippi State in architecture. If you met Janet Marie when she was a student in the South, you probably didn't forget her. And uh, she went on to many triumphs. And so we, I called her up and said, let's walk around Fenway Park. I don't know how she had done it. She knew the location of every beam, every duct, every rusting bolt, every door that wouldn't open, every kind of space that could be opened out for an enlargement in, into something else. Uh, someone who had started with the idea that everything was going to be solvable and found a way to solve it. And it, the richness of that, and everybody has talked about that, to take an existing building and adapt it for a later use is so much richer than tearing down an old building and building a new building. Uh, not to freeze it, not to freeze the old building, but to adapt it, to let it change and grow and become yet another one of the layers uh, that make the many layers of the Back Bay historically. Uh, I also have a poem about uh, Fenway Park. I don't know who wrote it. I saw it many years ago. It's a haiku. You know, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Bright leaves falling. Clear, blue sky, frost at dawn, autumn, Red Sox lose again. <laughs> we all know that's never going to happen again, but that history is still there. Second thought I had was uh, the Gropius House. It was, uh, it was acquired by an organization which was one of the participants in this organization, 
namely the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. And so I went out to see it. Mrs. Gropius was still there. Um, she told me everything there was to know about the building, and she never shut up for three hours. And I went back to the office where I was working with Jose Luis Cert. I was an associate in that office. And he said, how did it go? And I said, she's a nice lady, but she never shuts up. And Jose Luis looked at me and said, you should have seen her in 1929. <laughs> Architecture goes on. Um, I realized that when it was acquired, the house by the Preservation Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, it must therefore be an antiquity, and it dawned on me that it was one year younger than I was. <laughs> but it raised a lot of interesting issues about preservation. I think preservation is as fascinating as any other aspect of architecture. Uh, when the Gropius House was taken over by Spinea, of course, it was falling apart. It was uh, as um, older than I was. And uh, all of the bolts and screws and nuts and every little thing that had gone into the construction of the Gropius house uh, had worn out over time. And Gropius had bought them all from hardware stores because he was trying to prove that you could build modern architecture with ordinary materials, that you wouldn't need anything special. You could just take it off the shelf and build it. So two generations later, when I first knew it, all those things were worn out. And it raises a very, very interesting question. Do you go to the hardware stores of today to maintain the principle of building out of ordinary materials and therefore be building out of what are in fact all different materials? Or do you say, no, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna make all the materials what they were initially when they came out of hardware stores and that would mean making them all at enormous expense custom made. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that I find so interesting about preservation. Preservation is about time, and place. And for me, that's what architecture is about. It's about placing us where we are in time and where we are in space. Uh, I wanted to, adding to this list of incoherent and irrelevant topics, I wanted to talk about Taliesin East. Similar set of issues for preservation. Taliesin East is the home that Frank Lloyd Wright built for himself uh, in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And uh, many of you know it, many of you have visited it, I'm sure. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did not intend it to be a permanent house. He intended it to be a collection of experiments. And when I was out there once, his, one, of his old, he was, one of his former students was still alive, Wesley Peters, and Wesley said to me, Mr. Wright would get us up at four or five o'clock in the morning and have us pour concrete right on the grass. He didn't have patience enough to make a foundation because he had this bright idea for the next space, the next room. And so it has today the characteristic of being an improvisation, a series of improvisations. What does that mean for preservation? Do you stabilize the house so that it won't fall down and make it uh, a representation of what it no, no longer is? Or do you find some way of making a house that will still present itself as a collection of improvisations but without falling down? And the house is falling down and it's slow, slipping down the slope and all kinds of things are happening to it. Was that a comment on me? <laughs> um, I slept over in the bedroom in Taliesin East in Frank Lloyd Wright's and his wife's own bedroom. Uh, and you certainly got an impression of the house. Uh, none of the uh, furnaces were working. It was late October. All of the glass was separated from the frames and the windows so the air was blowing in. There were four or five electric heaters on the floor. I woke up in the morning and all, all of that, just as if the way the light was coming through into the room uh, from the exterior makes me uh, almost cry even to today. But it's a very interesting subject, isn't it? That's what preservation is about. What do we choose to preserve? Is that a bunch of experiments or is that a great work of architecture? I happen to, it happens to be my favorite piece of Frank Lloyd Wright architecture. Although that's a fast league. I don't want to talk more than my allotted four minutes, so I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, I had one other brief experience last weekend. I visited a house. Someone may know the owner, so I'm not going to mention that, but it's in a New England state. The owner made a lot of money and built, designed with an architect a house 
uh, in uh, what I would describe as a modern version of the arts and crafts style. And uh, uh, the owner didn't do so well financially in recent years and put the house, which has 25 acres of a New England state, and a, a, a guest house and an office and everything you can imagine in a swimming pool, uh, put it on the market for $14 million. Um, it has no, very few people have been interested in it. It's now four or five years later, and the price is down to $5.9 million if you're interested. That was, for me, another issue about preservation. That house was so completely designed by that designer who was not an architect but who was in the design professions that anyone coming into it would not be able to see it as anything but that owner's house. You could not make it someone else's house, and I think that's why it hasn't sold. And that's another issue then. What, what do we mean, what do we choose to preserve? Uh, do we choose to preserve, uh, I was at the American Academy in Rome, uh, um, Richard mentioned that, and uh, I, I love all the cities in, in Italy and partly because they all are different colors. They're all sort of off-white and some of them are more yellow and some of them are more red and some of them are more something else. And you can sort of get a sense of a kind of a uh, vocabulary of color. And uh, what they're doing in Rome now more and more is uh, removing all those colors because they've done what preservationists always do and I hope never will do again, which is to drill through all those layers of paint and find the original one and go back and paint that. Even though, as we all know, when we do that at home, when we hit that original color and paint it on the living room wall, we wake up in the morning and we say, oh my God, we'll never, <laughs> never do that one again. It's a set of issues that makes preservation as intellectually complex as any other aspect of the built environment. What do we choose to preserve? It's always a choice, it's always an expression, it's never just something we find in place. Uh, the definition that I use of architecture, which I've used many, many times, is architecture is the art of making places. And places can be rooms or gardens or cities or uh, regions. Uh, but they are places for human habitation. And uh, uh, architecture, um, I, confusing myself again, as I always do. Uh, I wrote, uh, places, are the, places are the boxes in which we file our memories. Fenway Park is such a box, and we owe it to the Preservation Alliance to keep it and others alive. Uh, I was tremendously impressed by the, pres by the award, the buildings that won the award programs this afternoon, and also in what a diversity of sites they were, uh, factories and warehouses and fancy houses in uh, the Back Bay and all the rest of it. It's really, really impressive, and it's so wonderful to see that. And uh, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, and thank the guys who did heroic architecture. I can't believe I got to follow that. That was the best three minutes ever. <laughs> thank you so much. That was awesome. That really was. One more. We inaugurated our President's Award in 2014. It is given to those who have made exceptional contributions to the city's success and vibrancy in a way that resonates with the Alliance's mission, which includes protecting the character of the city. I can't imagine a place more enmeshed with the city's character and a business more responsible for the city's vibrancy than Fenway Park and the Boston Red Sox. In the late 90s, with the threat of the park's demolition, rose the Save Fenway Group in collaboration with the Boston Preservation Alliance, fostering a message that the character of the park far outweighed its challenges. The broken seats, 
the outdated technology, the peeling paint, the quirky outfield, details, the rich history, irreplaceable. Tonight we recognize John Henry, Tom Warner, and Larry Lucchino because they embraced that message when they arrived on the scene in 2002. Together with the Director of Ballpark Planning and Development, Janet Marie Smith, they embraced the community and the rich history of Boston. This team saw the old park and its history as an asset, not a liability. Perhaps even more important is the way the revitalization of Fenway Park and the energy it brings has spread through the entire Kenmore Square area. Look around you, the, the results are jaw-dropping. This is proof that historic preservation works. Please let me introduce, with much appreciation, the recipient of this year's President's Award, the Boston Red Sox, Larry Lucchino. Thank you to the uh, Boston Preservation Alliance for both the recognition and the encouragement and along the way to make this uh, uh, preservation of Fenway Park happen. I salute you for the uh, tradition that you have established of, uh, uh, of announcing teams as opposed to individuals. Um, I appreciate that uh, an exception was made for uh, John Henry, Tom Warner, myself and our 15 other partners who made the uh, commitment both uh, spiritually as well as financially to preserve Fenway Park. Of the six groups attempting to purchase Fenway Park, excuse me, attempting to purchase the Boston Red Sox in 2001, ours was the only group that was committed to preserving, protecting, enhancing, uh, and maintaining Fenway Park exactly where it was. So uh, we feel a, a sense of satisfaction as a result. Um, nothing uh, great is ever done without a team, be it a team of partners or a team of uh, designers or construction people or architects or whatever. And uh, I would like to ask many members of the Red Sox team are here tonight to please stand up and be recognized. Please stand up. There is uh, one person that I would ask uh, to, to come up and, uh, and join me because uh, uh, her work, she was the uh, first person uh, that uh, we hired when I came to Boston at the uh, end of 2001. And uh, she would became the, uh, the conscious and the, uh, and the spirit and the energy and the creative force uh, behind the decade uh, or so of, re uh, of uh, renovation and improvement that was made here. So would you please uh, uh, allow me to bring up Janet Marie Smith. One word. I don't know what one word to say. Um, uh, when Larry first called me and uh, asked if I would uh, work on this project with him, I was elated because having worked for him in Baltimore on the creation of Camden Yards, uh, as is well known in the baseball world and in the urban planning world, 
Fenway was very much our model. The notion of building a ballpark that would be a part of an urban renaissance was something we really cared about. And it seemed kind of crazy to be building this thing in Baltimore and pointing northward and then have this building threatened as it was. So we were thrilled when we got here and we realized how much work, effort, and passion the Boston Preservation Alliance and Save Fenway Park had put into this. Uh, we took that as building blocks and um, with Larry's leadership um, and a lot of uh, a lot of passion and devotion, um, here we are. However many years later it is, uh, so thank you very much for recognizing this and thank you for allowing me to play a role. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Janet, uh, and uh, your contribution continues and the inspiration you provide to us uh, uh, here in, in Boston and at the Red Sox. Uh, I would like to st note uh, one thing that uh, we may, many of the team members uh, back there, take uh, uh, an oath when they uh, came to work on Fenway Park, and it's uh, quite emblematic of, I think, uh, what the Boston Preservation Alliance is all about. We asked them to take the uh, Fenway version of the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> Rule one, do no harm. And our goal was not just to expand it, to enhance it, to improve it, but it was also to retain the essential uh, gestalt, the essential feeling, the essential uh, charm of this ballpark. And, uh, and uh, with, uh, with the commitment of our partners and the, uh, and the leadership that, uh, uh, that Janet and DAIQ provided, we were able to do so. So uh, before we sit down, I would like Janet to uh, join me in saluting you all because I, I appreciate the recognition we have been accorded. It's, uh, we've won a, a number of championships in, in recent years despite the haiku that uh, Mr. <laughs> Campbell uh, uh, uttered earlier. Uh, we have uh, established a, 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 a charitable foundation that is probably the largest in, uh, in sports, certainly one of them. We have enhanced the relationship with the Jimmy Fund to, uh, to new levels and depths. And, uh, but uh, the accomplishment of uh, pre preserving Fenway Park and protecting Fenway Park is right at the top of our list of uh, elements of pride. And we should thank you for that because you not only inspired us, you specifically encouraged us, you cajoled us, you, uh, you insisted that we remain faithful to this. And many of the members of uh, Safe Fenway Park are out here today, and I want to specifically thank them. Uh, in, in support of this, I will tell you, there is some one uh, uh, picture, I don't know if, they, if that's the right term, there's a poster that I have framed. It sits right outside my door downstairs at Fenway Park, and I see it every day that I, that I am here. And I'd like to show you uh, what it is, and, and, and I hope it captures the appreciation that we feel for the Boston Preservation Alliance and all of the encouragement we received along the way. Janet, would you help me? I can't sit down without uh, congratulating the other uh, uh, Preservation Achievement uh, uh, Award winners uh, tonight. We are honored to be in your company and to share uh, your, your philosophy and your love for this uh, great city and for the preservation of this great city. Thank you very much. So about two hours before this started, the Red Sox did yet another generous thing and pointed in our direction. And they said, why don't you hand this out at the end of the day and do a little auction? So I'm not an auctioneer. I have no idea what I'm doing. I even have to read this because it'll be the first time. But effectively what it is, if any of you have a child that's between 6 and 15 years of age, um, they can be part of the groundskeeping team at a Fenway game, at a, at a Red Sox game. Uh, it also comes with four really good seats. 
And you can sort of pick your game, though something about the Yankees, that, that, that's not part of the thing. So anyway, um, it's an honorary grounds crew member. One child aged 6 through 15 assists the ground crew in preparing the field for the game. Includes the opportunity to watch from the warning track as the Red Sox take batting practice. You will receive four infield grandstand tickets where the honoree and three guests will watch the game. So I'm going to auction this off. This is not an auction. This will take 45 seconds and we'll move on to the best part. But um, I'm going to start the auction at $500. I'll do 900 <laughs> Do we have $1,000? I'll do 1,050. The fact that my son works with you makes it very difficult. <laughs> it really does. This is great. Anyone want to do more than 1,050? That's very nice. All right. 1,200? Sold. Thank you so much. Nothing like having the executive director having two board members fight it out in public. <laughs> but I was a little teary-eyed after the Red Sox, so that gave me a minute to collect myself. Sometimes being here in Boston every day, I, I fear that we get jaded to the fabulous treasures that surround us. And I just want to remind everyone, it's so important to look around as you walk to the office in the morning or at home or between meetings or to events like this and appreciate why we're so lucky to be here in Boston. I talk to many preservation peers around the country uh, and they're envious of what we have here. And I hope the projects we awarded tonight help us all recognize both the remarkable historic assets we have and the importance of our vigilance and support of efforts to enhance and protect the character of Boston. It can so easily go away if we're not careful. The story of Fenway in particular should remind us of the impact of the community voice in making sure Boston's unique character isn't lost. We need to question and push those who claim that it, it just doesn't make economic sense to save our history as we heard here in Fenway. We need to be clear, we need to be strong that this history has real social and economic value and that creative solutions that preserve historic resources ultimately benefit, benefit us all. The Alliance is proud and committed to playing that loud leadership role as we did with the Community Preservation Act recently or the nearby Sitco sign or Fenway years ago and as we do every day at the Alliance. I hope that the projects and the people we recognize tonight, tonight motivate each and every one of you to engage with the Alliance and continue to support our efforts. And finally, a few logistical reminders as we conclude. Again, award winners, please stay and join me up back there and overlooking the park in the city for photographs and to collect your awards. The reception is downstairs, food awaits, and I believe the World Series trophies as well for photographs. Uh, please share them on social media. The book booklet that you all receive, the annual, please look at this carefully, and it's not just a recognition of our sponsors and a recognition of all the wonderful award winners. That's all great and wonderful and you should read all that. But in the back, there's a ton of information, a resource that you can use all year long in terms of who to call in the city when you have preservation questions, how to get more engaged. Keep this on your coffee table at home, at the office, share it with your friends and family. Let us you know if you want more copies. Finally, I need to thank my staff. They each play such a critical role in making tonight a success. And they do that all year long. They're really what makes the Alliance work, not me. Allison Frazee, who you saw up here tonight, our Director of Advocacy. Paula Antonovich, who you probably saw at reception, our Development Associate. Uh, and Hannah Spiker, our Communications Manager, who keeps our social media alive and active. And let's have one final round of applause for all the winners tonight, all those who support the Alliance, and all of you for attending.
thank you for being a part of the community that makes Boston unique and successful. I am looking forward to speaking with all of you at the reception. Thank you.